So in our agenda today, um, we'll first of all just talk a little bit about where we've come from um, in terms of document management and also some of the drivers um, that um, are pushing us to adopt electronic document and man uh, management systems. We'll also talk about some of the options that are available to us, um, the benefits of having a more structured approach to electronic document management, some of the challenges that small to medium enterprises faces, um, the approach that we take to delivering uh, a document management solution for the life sciences in the cloud, some of the changing regulatory expectations, and then finally we'll finish up with some future trends in records management to think about. Now, during the presentation, um, if you do have any questions for us, um, please feel free to raise your hand. You'll see in the GoToMeeting uh, panel that there's a little button with a little hand that you can click on. Um, and at the end of the uh, webinar, we'll actually answer the questions. So we'll have a, a 10 minute period for any, any questions uh, and answers then. Um, if you don't want to raise your hand, you can also type a question in the question pane. Um, and I'll read the questions out at the end and, and provide answers. So where have we come from? EDMS has been around now for around 20 years, and I'm sure that a lot of you have come across um, different forms of electronic document management systems in your careers. The life sciences, as you know, are, are also typically very large producers of documents. Everything we do is documented, uh, and therefore we generate a significant amount of documentation. We've focused a lot uh, on data uh, in the past. If we think about the 90s and sort of the early 2000s, we were really focused on electronic data capture for clinical trials, so EDC systems. Um, and document management was always sort of uh, second place, really. Um, we knew it was important to manage documents, but it was much more important to get the data in quickly. And we still have a lot of paper records uh, in, in today's operations. Document management systems were traditionally thought of as, as enterprise systems and not really available to smaller organizations for various different reasons. Um, however, we are now seeing new systems emerge, uh, particularly cloud-based systems, which uh, open up uh, the possibilities to smaller to medium-sized enterprises, and that's what we'll be talking about today. So if we think about the different documents we're dealing with, First of all, I think it's important to, to, to know that we're dealing with a significant number of documents. If we think about um, an NDA submission, so a new drug application, um, I think somebody told me once that it was around two trucks worth of documents that we had to deliver to the agency. That's a significant number of documents, and that's just the documents that we're submitting. There are also a lot of other documents that we need to manage um, around the operations and, and within the TMF. So if we think about the different types of documents, in the TMF there's typically around 350 different types of documents that we have to manage. Regulatory documents, we're talking another 150 or so. We then have our, our different quality documents, so there, there's around 30 different types of quality documents and records. And then finally we have a, a whole series of other different documents and records as well that we need to manage. So very quickly we can see that we have a lot of complexity um, through the different types of documents that we need to manage, but also just because of the sheer volume. In addition to that, we still very much have um, a paper mindset in, in today's, today's world. Um, we still organize documents, even if we organize them electronically in, in folders, we still have this concept um, of, of organizing things in folders. We also still produce a lot of uh, paper uh, or electronic outputs that we that we actually sign. We we're systematically signing and we're signing on paper. We also produce paper like outputs from electronic systems and then file them away in our central files. And so this, you know, an example of this would be a safety report, for example, um, that we produce from our pharmacovigilance system. We're still producing um, a paper-based or a PDF report that we're actually filing away in our systems. We also tend to print out um, a lot of our content for inspections. We're still not 100% comfortable giving access to all of our electronic documents and our EDMS to the inspector uh, when they arrive. We much prefer to produce paper because we feel that we can control it better. 
So if we ask ourselves why, why are we still thinking like this? There are, there are definite um, reasons. I think the first one is that it's just very complex. Documents are being produced by many different stakeholders in many different locations, especially if we think about global clinical trials where we have many, many clinical sites in many different countries. EDMS systems have been traditionally expensive and time consuming to implement. Um, in traditional setups, it could take up to two, two, uh, two years or so to actually define uh, the configuration for a specific EDMS and then get it in place and validate it. We also feel that file shares are, are relatively inexpensive, uh, but, but they do require the use of folders to manage content. We've typically used folders really to, to, to describe um, the, the different documents that we're organizing. File shares also are very easy to understand. Everybody is so used to using file shares, it's, it's, it's very comfortable for them to, uh, to continue with that, that paradigm. And then finally, um, without a validated EDMS, it's quite often difficult to demonstrate that we meet the requirements of 21 CFR Part 11, especially when it comes to managing electronic documents or records on file shares. We could be questions as to whether uh, that, that really is compliant with Part 11. So if we think about document management and, and, and systems, what, what are the different options that we have? The first option is obviously paper. You know, there's nothing wrong with paper. It's still perfectly acceptable from a regulatory standpoint to manage things on paper. Um, and you know, it may make sense for your organization to continue using paper. It's also obviously easy to understand and implement. We've been doing it for, for millennia. Not very uh, efficient, however, and it's also very difficult quite often to find information um, using you know, obviously paper filing systems. It can also be very expensive to maintain archives over time. Some of the retention periods that we have in different jurisdictions can be very long. For example, here in Canada, um, records retention is 25 years. And so doing that with paper can be a, a significant challenge. The other option is to continue on with our electronic file shares. Um, so this obviously mimics a, a paper-based system where we're using folders to file things away. Um, we also have very limited search capabilities. Um, we don't have any metadata here, so it's very difficult sometimes to find documents. And I'm sure that you've all been in a situation where you're clicking through a file structure, uh, trying to, to, to find a document, you do 15 different clicks, just to find that the document's actually not there. Security can also be a challenge. It can be very complex in, in the file share and very difficult to, to manage. And there's also no audit trail by default. Um, which raises the question as to whether a file share can be 21 CFR Part 11 compliant if we're storing uh, electronic records uh, within that file share. Third option is obviously uh, moving to an EDMS. And we, can, we can have uh, our EDMS installed on premise, so within our organization. Um, typically, when we do this, we're, we're really talking about an enterprise type solution, so the, the larger types of systems. Um, and this, of course, can be very costly to implement and, and maintain. Uh, it's, however, easier to, to integrate um, an on premise EMS with other uh, applications. And quite often, we do need to integrate because obviously, some applications are producing records that we want to be able to store within our EDMS. Also, applications may be providing information which we're using for our metadata to be able to properly classify documents. So an example would be if we were storing a safety report, which came from our pharmacovigilance system, we may want to be able to pull the case ID from that system as well and apply it as metadata when we store that document in our system. An on-premise installation also requires in-house expertise to be able to properly manage the system. Um, and Quite often, this type of system is not really warranted for smaller organizations because they don't really have the um, capacity to be able to deploy and manage it. Final option is, is a cloud-based EDMS. So this is very similar to the EDC world where a third party is actually hosting your system for you and, and managing that system and ensuring that that system is secure and properly validated. Um, 
when it comes to a cloud-based system, the upfront investment is fairly minimal and it's significantly lower than an on-premise system. It's usually a pay-per-use model, so you pay for what you need, um, and quite often it will be multi-tenant, which means that you're sharing um, hardware resources and even software resources between uh, various different customers. And so you may be sharing your environment with other pharma companies or other CROs. With a cloud-based solution, because the vendor is pretty much managing everything, there's really a, a minimal in-house expertise requirement to be able to manage the system. Typically, you'll have some super users um, who are in charge of managing um, the, the, the system from an end user standpoint, but everything else is being managed by the vendor. With a cloud-based solution, however, what you see is what you get, and that's that horrible acronym. Um, basically, uh, with a multi-tenant environment, you typically have minimal customization allowed, um, unless, of course, you go with a dedicated cloud environment, which is fairly similar to on-premise. It's being, it's being hosted in the cloud. Now, if we think about some of the drivers which push companies to, to implement uh, an EDMS, I've, I've sort of listed some of them here. I think the first one at the top is, is ECTD. Obviously, um, we are moving more and more towards electronic submissions. Um, and this is becoming a requirement, in fact, by the agencies because they no longer want to deal with those trucks or documents being delivered. Um, and so to be able to do ECTD successfully, typically you need to have an EDMS to be able to manage and produce all of that, those documents before they're built into a submission. Another reason why companies will implement an EDMS is because they're having versioning issues. This I think is one of the big problems where you, when you're dealing with a file share or with paper documents, it's very, very difficult to version those documents. And typically, an EDMS will have versioning built in, and so it, it really becomes a no-brainer. Another reason for uh, implementing EDMS is because our teams are becoming much more global. Uh, we typically are working with teams of, in, in many different locations, um, and we need to collaborate with those teams and those people. And so by having a centralized EDMS, it, it really facilitates that significantly. The other thing that it helps us reduce is, is the email. So Companies who are not using the EDMS typically are using email to manage things like review and approval um, of documents. And this poses many different problems. The primary problem, of course, is versioning and, and which is the latest version. Uh, but also there are security issues as well with using emails to distribute um, content. Another reason why we implement EDMS is partnerships. Today, um, in the drug development world, and even in the manufacturing world, we typically have a lot of different partners that we're working with. Um, and these partners need to get access to our content, but also will provide content, documents, um, in, in the, pro, in the uh, carrying out of their, of their, their operations and, and duties. Uh, and so by having a centralized EDMS, it really facilitates the exchange of information with our partners. Another driver would be archiving, uh, so the, the cost of archiving, uh, the effectiveness of archiving, and also the space required just to physically store paper documents. Due diligence is also an important factor. This is especially important for smaller organizations who are very dependent on finding uh, new investors or, or partners um, to help finance their R&D activities. And by having a, a very organized uh, content management or document management system where we can easily find documents during a due diligence situation is paramount. And it really shows the potential investor that you really have good control over, over your science, but also over your documentation. Another reason for implementing EDMS would be for, for the security and control. As we mentioned, file shares are actually quite challenging. To, to secure um, because of the, the sheer volume and, and sheer number of types of documents that we need to manage. Um, and having a, a centralized EDMS really helps us uh, improve security. We can deploy a centralized security model and we can also improve control over who has access to content. Um, and even through audit trials, we can see who's access to content, which is very important as well. 
for certain types of documents. The last reason that I'm highlighting, and, and there are others of course, is, is information and knowledge management. Documents represent a significant body of knowledge, um, as well as the metadata that's associated to those documents. And a good EDMS will allow us to fully uh, exploit that through the use of, of search tools, but also through the use of business intelligence to be able to gain insight into what's happening in our study through the presence of, of different documents, or just to gain insight into the different operations of, of reviewing and approving documents. Now I've listed some high level requirements of an EDMS, so this is typically what most organizations will be looking for. Um, of course, when you're, 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 you're going out and, and looking to implement an EDMS, you'll probably get into a little bit more detail, but these, these are really the high level um, requirements that all uh, document management systems really should have. So the first um, requirement is to be able to organize and classify all documents and records, so to be able to manage all of your content within that one system. But the other, uh, or the next requirement, is to be able to assign metadata values to content, so to be able to describe the documents. To be able to manage collaboration on documents in one central location, and so your, your system really should be available in one central location, but to all of the various different global teams um, that are working within that system. To be able to distribute document templates. Document templates are extremely important in our, in our uh, business, uh, especially when it comes to regulatory documents. And so a document management system should allow us to distribute uh, and, and update our templates. We should also be able to version documents, and this should be done almost automatically uh, with the system, with minor and major versioning, uh, and also uh, be able to maintain document history, so to be able to go back in time and actually see what a document looked like um, at a particular version. We should be able to manage document revisions um, and source documents. And so typically, in the pharma world, we're producing PDF records, which we're using um, to either present to an inspector or to submit. Um, those PDF documents are quite often generated from Word, uh, so Microsoft Word documents. Um, and we need to be able to create a link between the two so that we can always go back to the source should we require uh, a new revision of that particular document. We should be able to manage all of the final records centrally uh, and provide access to those records to inspectors or auditors. We should be able to apply retention policies to records. This is also very important. We have to have very specific retention policies, um, again, based on jurisdiction and types of documents. Typically, that will be defined in our SOP, and the system should allow us to uh, implement those policies automatically. We should be able to apply very granular security and also audit trails to the documents and records. Remember, the, the goal is to go electronic, and therefore, the records that we are producing be producing our electronic records per 21 CFR Part 11 and therefore require audit trials. We need to be able to implement electronic signatures uh, of records, so directly in the system, being able to sign documents electronically, again in a Part 11 compliant manner. And then finally, provide records for submissions. So the EDMS has to provide the final content, which will then be included in our ECTD submissions. And so typically, most of the uh, ECTD vendors now integrate with the, the mainstream EDMS platforms. So those are the high level requirements, of course, you would need to get into more detail. So some of the benefits of, of a document management system or electronic document management system is that we have better version control of documents, we have improved collaboration between the different study stakeholders, we improve the timeliness of document authoring and collection. This is quite often a problem when it comes to paper or email-based review and approval cycles, um, where documents sit on somebody's desks for weeks or weeks on end, or, or somebody doesn't see an email. Um, with a document management system, you typically have workflows which will manage um, the life cycle uh, of that review or, or approval process, and will also escalate if people don't meet their timeline. And so that's very, very important, and that's definitely a regulatory expectation as well. We reduce um, the amount of document collaboration via email. 
and also reduce uh, the security risks and uh, the storage issues as well that we can have with email. We improve security, control and traceability of our documents and we're able to ensure more reliable backups of documents and records because they're all in one place and they're not sitting on people's desktops. We're also able to reduce document management and archiving cost, improve our ability to search for content and improve knowledge management. Finally, we can also improve regulatory compliance because we can demonstrate the custody and traceability of records and also um, we can ensure more consistent content through the use of templates, especially for our regulatory documents that we need to submit. So I'm going to go through now um, a series of nine different steps um, that we would typically go through to select and implement an EDMS solution. Uh, we also have a, a copy of this checklist available on our website for download if, if you feel that it's useful. So the first step that we need to go through um, when we want to select and implement a solution is we need to establish a clear set of requirements. And these requirements have to be very concise and measurable. These requirements really will uh, serve as the basis for selecting a solution, um, but also will serve as a basis for validating that solution once we've selected it and implemented it. Once we've established those requirements, uh, we also typically will establish um, different process diagrams of our current document management process or processes, because typically you'll have several processes within your organization and then the future state of what we're really looking to implement because obviously if you're moving from a manual or paper world into an electronic world you really want to re-engineer your processes at the same time it's actually quite surprising going through this exercise and i've done it with quite a few different clients the number of duplications and inconsistencies we see with existing processes so it really is a very worthwhile exercise to map your existing processes out um, it's also an opportunity to try and standardize processes across departments um, this obviously improves quality but also can reduce the the cost and time required to implement electronic processes within an edms when you're establishing your requirements, you also need to decide whether you want to have a cloud-based or an on-premise solution. And you may not have the answer straight away, but you definitely will need to think about it because obviously this can have an impact on your requirements um, and the way that you evaluate vendors. And so you definitely need to, to establish whether you know, a cloud-based solution is going to be acceptable for your organization or you know, if you prefer on-premise or if you're, you're, you're um, happy either way. That's something that really needs to be defined. Once you've got your requirements, um, the next thing you need to do is you need to identify the different vendors that are available to be able to provide such a system for you. Um, when you're doing this, you need to think about vendors that could be a good fit for your organization's size, needs, and processes, because not uh, one, one size does not fit all um, in the EDMS space. You should also ask the vendors to review um, your, your document for the future document management processes um, and provide a gap assessment between their standard processes and yours to see if their system would be a good fit or not out of the box or whether it would require a lot of customization. Most vendors will be happy to do this. The next thing we need to do is, is RFI, RFP. Um, and I, I, would, I would stress that the first thing you need to do is evaluate whether you actually have to do an RFI, RFP. You may have identified a vendor that's really a good fit for you and, and, and you're happy to move forward. Or it may be that, in fact, you've only identified two vendors and it doesn't really make sense to go through um, the motions of doing a full-blown RFI, RFP. And so this is really something you need to decide at this point. Um, it could also be something that's defined by company policy or SOP and you may be required to do it anyway. Um, but if you are, then obviously be mindful of vendor's time because these things can take a lot of time to complete. Um, and if you've already made your decision, it may not be quite ethical to send it out to 10 different vendors. You need to also define how you'll uh, evaluate the vendor responses. So there are many different ways of doing that. Uh, Typically, there are sort of various different scoring matrices 
Um, it could be also that you'll set up a, uh, an end user committee that will evaluate vendors uh, based on their responses and demos, but you need to define that up front. Um, you also need to build an RFI document based on your requirements, and so this document should be very uh, concise and specific about what information you would like from the vendor. And again, try and keep them manageable. Um, you know, there are lots and lots of different things that we can ask a vendor, but it's very important to focus on what's most important because not only will it take the vendor a lot of time if, if you don't do that, um, but also the quality of the response may not be great um, and it will also take you a lot of time to actually evaluate the RFIs and time that you may not have. And so you have to be very, very careful about how much information you ask for. Um, and that, that RFI document, of course, will be based on your requirements. Once you get uh, responses back, you need to shortlist. Uh, obviously, you're not going to ask 10 different vendors to demo. Again, it's, it's a time problem. Not everybody has time to sit through that many demos. And so try and shortlist from the initial response before you move on to the next stage. So the next stage, step four, is really the vendor selection. And so when you, when you select the vendor, you need to select it based on their, their response and their ability to meet your requirements. Before you make a, a final decision, uh, you may want to do a certain amount of due diligence, and this can be in the form of a, a, an audit, um, and that audit could be on-site, um, or it could be a postal audit, uh, where you're asking a series of questions around the vendor's ability to be able to support your needs as a client, and also their ability to meet the regulatory requirements. You should also verify references. And when you ask for references, ask for um, references of, from, from similar companies to yours who are sort of managing um, similar types of products or are in the same stage of development or a similar size uh, to your organization. And then finally, once you've made your decision, you should obviously contract with the vendor. It's very important to have that contract before you get started. Um, so that you can clearly define exactly what they're going to be providing you. Um, if you're going with a cloud-based solution, you should also make sure that there's an adequate service level agreement in place. And that service level agreement should cover things like support and system uptime um, and disaster recovery and things like that. So you really want to make sure that that's in place. Um, and if you don't have anybody in your organization who can evaluate those kinds of things, you should definitely look to a consultant to help you uh, properly evaluate and make sure that you, do, you have everything you need in that service level agreement uh, to feel comfortable that your, your documents are going to be safe. The next step is to establish a standard taxonomy. Um, and this is, a, this is a very important step, and it's quite often the step that can take a lot of time um, because of the number of different types of documents. Uh, that we need to manage uh, within the context of clinical R&D or manufacturing. So the taxonomy is really a standard set of document names and metadata uh, in its simplest form. When we're establishing the taxonomy, it's very important to try and leverage the EDM and TMF reference model as much as possible because this really will serve you um, later on down the road. And we'll talk a little bit more around taxonomies in a moment best practices for establishing them. When you do establish them, you should definitely try and standardize again across the various different functional areas. Once you have your taxonomy, you can then start to establish the configuration for the system. Now, most vendors will already have existing configurations for the types of organizations um, such as yours. And so if you can, try and leverage that configuration from the vendor because it really will save you a lot of time and cost. A lot of this will depend on whether you already have um, a, a, an existing standard in-house and how flexible you are in terms of changing that standard. If you are um, going to be deploying the system in-house, um, the configuration really should be managed by configuration control SOP. And there'll also be a whole series of other SOPs that you need to put in place to be able to properly manage that system and those, those SOPs need to be in place before you finalize the deployment. If you're deploying on the cloud, quite often the vendor will actually define the configuration with you. And especially in a multi-tenant world, typically 
kind of there'll only be a certain number of things you can actually configure, um, and the vendor will be able to provide you with the information that you need to be able to define your configuration. So once we've got our configuration uh, set, um, the next step, step seven, is to deploy and validate the solution. So if you are deploying in-house, um, then of course you have to have the proper SOPs to be able to validate and manage the system. When it comes to an off-the-shelf system such as an EDMS, you really only need to validate the customizations and the implementation of your processes. And so this is really known as user acceptance testing. Most of the other testing that's required uh, will have already been done by the vendor. Um, and that's where it's important to verify this during the due diligence from the previous step to make sure that they have all of the proper testing documentation in place and that it's going to meet the, the, the regulatory requirements and stand up to audit or inspection. For your user acceptance testing, you should try and leverage um, vendor documentation if possible. Quite often they'll have a series of test scripts that you can use as a starting point and then maybe adapt um, based on your processes. When it comes to cloud-based solutions, they're usually pre-validated um, and really only require a minimal amount of UAT, especially again in a, in a, in a multi-tenant cloud solution um, because there's not that much you're actually changing. And then finally, um, when you're thinking about rolling out uh, your new EDMS, it's very important to do it in a very manageable way. And so we recommend that you do it in a staged manner where you're deploying um, to different departments or you're deploying for different um, products in the staged manner and not deploying to the whole organization in one shot uh, because it would be very, very difficult to manage. Step eight is probably one of the most important steps, and that's training. So it's very, very important to have a good training program in place. User adoption of an EDMS can be very challenging, and this is because quite often users don't have that much experience with an EDMS, and they don't really understand the concepts um, such as metadata or, or document collaboration. So it's very important to explain to them how they, they can use these things and why they're important. Um, and so this is obviously done in a, in a comprehensive training program um, to facilitate that adoption. Another good um, tip is to, is to produce cheats, cheat sheets. Um, and these cheat sheets, again, could be provided by the vendor as a starting point. Um, and you may want to adapt them to your company's specific uh, processes or, or organization. Um, but they typically are very, very useful. They're very easy to use. Uh, for people to, to understand you know, the, main, the main functions of the system. Again, the vendor should also have user guides, um, which you should leverage, and they may also have other documentation, which will help you train your users. You should also define clearly who's training. Is it the vendor or is it you? Um, quite often, vendors may adopt a train-the-trainer approach where they train super users, and then after this, afterwards, those super users will train your internal teams. Step nine, and the final step, is, is really expand and maintain. Um, and so one of the first things that's, that's really key is to have proper system management procedures in place, and system governance procedures, so that we know exactly who's responsible for what when it comes to managing the system. And then also, how do we make changes to the system? Um, how do we migrate documents and things like that? Um, so all of that needs to be properly defined in procedures. We also um, uh, then have the opportunity to expand the use of the system. Um, so in your requirements, you should have stated that you wanted to use, for example, the system with partners is externally, um, but it may not be something that you do straight away. And so over time, you can start to expand um, to external users and partners or vendors. Um, and you can, of course, also improve um, the system by using it in more departments or, or managing more and more content or improving reporting, for example. Um, to be able to, to better gain knowledge from the various different documents that we have in the system. Now I want to touch a little bit on some of the models and standards. In the clinical world, um, we have quite a few different standards. Most of them pertain to data. 
So of course we have the, the CDISC standards, we have standards that also come from ICH, um, but they're very focused on data. Having said this, um, in the last few years, we've seen the emergence of two key uh, reference models. So the DIA EDM reference model and the CMF reference model. Um, and these two reference models have been defined by a consortia of, of industry uh, groups uh, and organizations. So pharma companies, CROs, universities, and medical device companies, all of the various different types of organizations that are present in our industry. Um, and there's even been input from the various different regulators as well. Um, and today, um, I think the TMF reference model is maybe slightly more well known than the EDM reference model. The EDM reference model is more for regulatory documents, whereas the TMF reference model is for trial master file documents. Um, but they, there has been a lot of success in the implementation of those models. The other model that's important within document management is obviously ECTD, which is used for regulatory documents and, and for submitting those documents uh, to the agencies. And that also provides us maybe with a starting point for defining the names and some of the metadata for those documents. The use of these industry models and standards really does facilitate collaboration, uh, inspection, and, and interchange. So it's very important to consider them when you're defining your taxonomy or your configuration for your EDMS. It's also important to know that many of the vendors have also already implemented these different models within their solutions as well. And if you need more information on these, you can find information on the DIA website or on the ICH website for ECTD. Let's talk a little bit about taxonomies um, and the importance of establishing one. So just for clarification, I've got a definition here of what a taxonomy is. and It sort of talks about animals, really, or organisms. So the classification of organisms in, in an ordered system that indicates natural relationships. Now, obviously, uh, documents are not organisms, uh, but the principle is the same. Um, the second definition is the science laws or principles of classification systematics and then finally uh, number three division of into ordered groups or categories and so it's all about organizing things or organizing documents and that's why it's so important to have one so what can we do with a taxonomy the first thing we can do with one obviously is implement a, a document uh, management or information management system and it really is the heart of that system because it, it, it defines how we organize everything in that system we can also centralize terms and classification across systems to facilitate integration and improve standardization. So what I mean by that is if we have a system that's talking about protocol number as a piece of information, it would be important that any other system integrating with that initial system also talks about protocol number so that we can match those two terms together and transfer data. It can also be used to automate processes through the use of metadata and classification. We can use a taxonomy to identify documents and records when we're searching. We can manage the records life cycle and retention, so we can predefine that. We can search for information based on predefined classifications. And then finally, we can generate metrics and KPIs from the metadata that we've defined in our taxonomy. So how do you go about defining it? It's not an easy task. Um, it can take a lot of resources um, and requires input from the whole organization. And so the first thing you really need to do is establish governance rules around the taxonomy. So how are we actually going to manage that taxonomy? Who's going to be responsible for it? You then need to perform a gap assessment of your existing standard um, and the reference models. Um, because obviously you want to be able to leverage those reference models to gain the benefit um, of, of what they, they, they present. And so by performing the gap assessment, we can already evaluate um, whether your existing standards map to those reference models or whether you need to make changes. During that gap assessment, you should really produce a document uh, which you're going to use um, in your workshops with the various different functional groups with the current standard and then the proposed standards. As I said, you need to reference the leverage models as much as possible, 
Um, and you also, when you're defining the standards, you're not only defining structures of documents and document names, but you're also defining standard sets of metadata that can be used across documents. Once you've got that initial working document, you then organize work groups with the various different functional areas who will then review um, and then refine that standard so that you can come to a final agreement as to what your central taxonomy is. Finally, you then update um, the taxonomy um, and, and finalize it and then deploy it within your system. So now I want to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we see for small to medium enterprises who, uh, who are trying to manage documents. I think one of the first challenges is the, the cost of acquisition of an on-premise EDMS solution has, has traditionally been prohibitive. We're quite often talking about systems that cost hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, and for smaller companies, that's just not an option. Also, quite often, there's a lack of in-house staff to manage uh, an EDMS solution. You know, if we're talking about a company that has, say, 20 or 30 employees, they don't really have um, dedicated IP, IT people that can manage this solution or dedicated document management people to manage it. There's also quite often a lack of time or knowledge to define the configurations required for an EDMS. Another big challenge that SMEs have is, is inspection readiness or, or audit readiness or due diligence readiness. Um, and without an EDMS, they, they're, they're quite often faced with trying to produce paper um, for these different events. And then finally, um, SMEs typically also outsource a lot, especially to CROs. Um, and quite often, it's very difficult for them to archive the documents from those CROs or other vendors at the end of the study. Uh, maybe having an EDMS could, could help. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about um, Montreal's solution, so Montreal Connect, um, and a cloud-based EDMS model that we've put in place. So our model is based on the SharePoint 2013 system, um, and it's a multi-tenant environment in that it's an environment which is shared by multiple different clients. Our solution has full enterprise EDMS features, so all of the things you would typically see in an enterprise system are in this system. It's also fully mapped to the EDM and TMF reference model. Now the interesting thing about this solution is it's pay per user per month. So you're really only paying for what you need and this can change on a monthly basis. And there's also a fairly minimal setup cost because the system really is already pre-configured. It can be up and running within two to four weeks, again, depending on the number of changes you made. And it's really targeted to smaller and medium sized enterprises. Currently, this solution includes full configurations for ETMF and regulatory documents, and we're also adding further configurations in the coming months, notably for medical devices and other areas of R&D. The way it works is that Montreal is responsible for setting up the system and the day-to-day -day management of the system, so you don't require any internal resources to really manage things. We also follow our, our own SOPs for things like security, disaster recovery, backup, validation, all of the various different activities that we require to perform to be able to meet the regulatory requirements and properly safeguard your documents. We provide you with uh, training and, and, and support uh, to be able to properly use the system. And we also make all of the changes to your configuration on your behalf. You just have to request the changes. Finally, um, you do need to do something, and notably what you do is, is, is manage your documents and manage the metadata around those documents. That's your primary focus. The components of the system um, are, are really built upon a file plan. Um, so this is really our taxonomy, and it's a standard taxonomy that we've defined um, over many years, and it's based on best uh, industry practice. This um, taxonomy has over 900 different types of documents, uh, depending on what you're managing. We also have all of the classification and lifecycle parameters for each of the documents in there, and we are also able to define publishing parameters as well. Now, that file plan is used to build out um, working areas for each different functional area of your organization. 
And within that functional area, there are document management structures or libraries, um, which uh, are configured with all of the different types of documents, um, as well as the different templates and metadata. Um, and that's all done automatically for you. We then have our workflow engine, um, which manages the lifecycle process for every single document in the system. So as soon as you create a document, a lifecycle will kick off so that we can properly review and approve that document and get it filed away as a final record. We also have unique document numbering so that we can generate unique IDs for every document in the system. Document classification so that we can automatically classify documents so that you have to enter a really a minimal amount of metadata. And then finally, we have automatic filing of those records so that there's no mistake as to where those, those records need to go. Um, the system automatically files them based on the file plan. Finally, we have a central file structure, and this is really where all of our final records are stored with audit trail and record retention. Um, we really like to separate out final records from draft content because we don't want inspectors or auditors necessarily looking at draft content. Um, we would also uh, be able to see documents in different structures, of course, based on, on the classification parameters that we've applied to the documents when we created them. Integrated into the system, we also had digital signatures and a PDF renderer, which allows us to produce PDFA version 1.4 um, documents, which are obviously uh, the required format for electronic submissions to the agencies. So I want to quickly now talk about um, a case study um, from the regulators to give you an idea of, uh, as to where they're going. Last year, um, the EMA uh, published a position paper um, in which they gave us a lot more clarity in terms of what they're looking for for electronic trial master files. And obviously, trial master files is, is the bulk of our documentation that we're producing. It also laid down the conditions by which, which they wanted to inspect the electronic trial master files. And this is really the first um, indication of, of their expectations that we have. Um, when I looked at this, it was actually surprising that they have very, you know, the same or very similar requirements to, to sponsors themselves. And we'll look at that now. So the, the, the regulators in this reflection paper, and I, I definitely recommend that you go and download it and read it because it's very interesting and insightful, but they can be summarized uh, as follows. Um, they want to be able to see all the study information in one place. And that can be quite challenging because quite often we can have content and information in many different systems. And so that's really a very challenging requirement to meet today. But there are, there are definite ways and means of doing that. Um, they want to be able to review um, the information without intervention from, from sponsors or clinical site staff. So basically, they want you to give access to your document or content management system. They want the information to be collated in a timely manner. So it has to be up to date. Quite often in, in the past, we've always treated the trial master file as an afterthought, and it's really just a, uh, a process of collecting up documents so that we have everything we need in case we get inspected. Um, what the inspectors are saying is that they want to see that documents are being collected in a timely way. Um, so probably within, the, within 30 days of creation, they should be in the electronic trial master file ready for inspection. The inspectors uh, want to be able to reconstruct the events of the study uh, and evaluate compliance with GCP. They also want to be able to access the system without uh, uh, a lot of training, so they want a minimal amount of training. That can also be quite challenging because obviously you can't train the inspector for two days. It has to be within maybe 15, 20 minutes. And um, they've also highlighted that there could be a potential for inspections to be done at a distance. and so. If we think about all of these different requirements, um, they're definitely things that we would also need to try and build into our EDMS solution. Now, if we think about the uh, requirements for an ETMF for a sponsor, they're actually quite similar. The first thing that they want to know is they want to understand the status of the clinical trial and the trial master file in real time. So this is where the timeliness comes in. It's very important to have timely information. Um, they want to be able to present all ETMF records in one federated ETMF. 
so pull the data and documents from everywhere into one place. They want to be able to leverage um, the ETNF content to facilitate a risk-based approach, which is also something that's um, very current in the clinical trial space, so risk management, implementing risk-based clinical trials and risk-based monitoring. They want to be able to view uh, ETMF record structures in different views based on metadata. So the regulatory group, for example, will have a different way of looking at documents compared to clinical operations, let's say. They want to be able to answer key questions through structured and unstructured queries in natural language. So this is really where search comes in and the importance of search. And they want to ensure that the authoritative source is clearly identified and that there's only one version of the truth I and mean, this is really what document management systems can bring us. Finally, they want to reduce the overhead of maintaining an electronic trial master file and transform it into a source of valuable knowledge. So that really gives us an idea of where we're going um, with trial master files and also where the agencies are going as well. So to finish up, I just wanted to highlight a few future trends in EDMS. I think the first one is obviously the regulators are going electronic. They're, they're, they're gearing up and they're, they're starting to really understand what electronic document management systems are and, and how they want to use them. Um, we also are seeing a, a, a big surge in the use of cloud computing um, across the board. And for document management systems, this will also in the future become the new norm. It won't make sense anymore to have those systems in-house. Uh, documents will drive more and more processes as we have more and more document management systems and document metadata will be able to drive more processes such as site initiation or closure or things like that. We'll also be seeing um, the emergence of um, data, so XML files being used to documents. So our 1572s, for example, will no longer be PDFs, they'll be XML, which will be submitted directly to the agencies. And then finally, uh, interchange standards will become mainstream. Today, we don't really have any interchange standards other than ECTD, and it's a significant problem. But this is really something that's being worked on actively at the moment, and that's something that we'll see integrated into EDMS. So final recommendations. Um, it's very important to clearly define your needs um, and process uh, upfront before choosing a solution. You should properly vet cloud-based providers to ensure that your documents are going to be properly protected. You should try and adopt industry models and best practices, um, which are already built into the solutions that are being provided by the vendors. You should stage your EDMS rollout so you can gradually bring the system to the various different departments or functions. And you should encourage your partners and vendors to collaborate within your environment so everybody's within the same environment. So in conclusion, um, it's becoming very clear that because our world is, is becoming more and more electronic, we really need um, to implement electronic document management systems as we've done for clinical data. There are real cloud-based options out there now which allow small to medium enterprises to really access uh, enterprise-grade electronic document management systems quickly and cost-effectively, and so it's definitely worth while considering that option. Um, and finally, I think it's about time we can wrap papers. We've been talking about this for many, many years, and I think that we now have the ability to do it. Um, and so that really should be a focus um, for your organization as you move forward. So I'm now going to open um, the floor up to questions. Um, and so you'll be able to see in your um, panel um, that there's a, uh, there's a question um, panel or there's a button for you to be able to raise your hand. So feel free um, to, to raise your hand. So I have one question uh, from a participant who's, who's raised the question through the question panel um, in relation to um, FDA inspection, whether our, our solution has ever been inspected by the FDA. The answer to that is, is no or not to our knowledge. Uh, 
The reason why is because it's typically this type of system is not a system that would be inspected unless there was a reason for it to inspect it. So for course, um, that's, that's the current situation. Now, if a client is using um, the system for ETMF, in the future, there's, a, there's actually a large potential that the system will be um, accessed by the inspectors, but they may not actually inspect all of the system documentation. They may just want to look at the content. So I don't um, see any other hands being raised. Um, so if um, if you do have any other questions um, for for me um, following this webinar, please feel free to send me an email. Um, I'll bring up my uh, contact details on screen. Um, we will also inform you of any future webinars um, which we'll be planning over the next few months. And I'd like to thank everybody for for taking time for joining today. And I hope that the webinar was. Uh, insightful and gave you some good ground information as you move forward with your EDMS implementations. Thank you.